Well, would you open your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to study this morning verses 17 through 25. Um, so far in our series, we've learned that the gospel of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection makes us thankful people, makes us thankful people. Remember Paul said, I thank God for all of you. I'm so thankful for you. And it's because of the grace that is always at work in the heart of a Christian and in the heart of you as a Christian, but it's working in the hearts of all Christians, even the Christians we may be struggling with. And when we're remembering God's grace is at work in that Christian, doesn't that give us a thankfulness that this is, gonna, this is going to work out? It may not work out in the way I want it to be or in the timing that I want it to be, but we can be thankful because God's grace is at work in our hearts. And it makes us a united group of people, not a divided group of people. The gospel is our, is our source and hope of unity. And that's what we learned last week. This morning, we're going to learn that being gospel-centered makes us a joyful people. And, and it's joyful, not, not like as an emotion. The object of that joy, the source of that joy, Paul calls the power and the wisdom of God in the message of the cross. Is that where your joy is? In the power and the wisdom of God displayed through the cross and in the message of the cross. So would you join me as we follow Paul's words? They're holy and inspired, sufficient, authoritative words from the scriptures, beginning in verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles, all but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Heavenly Father, we, we just continue to ask that you would use this dear book to grow us to be a more gospel-centered people. Not just gospel-centered in things in the doctrine of salvation, God, we want to be gospel-centered in every thought we think, every emotion we have, every choice we make, every relationship in our sphere of life. Oh, God, we, we want to be sound in the doctrine of the gospel. Oh, but God, we want to be sanctified. We want to be living in the culture of the gospel. And when we think of gospel community, God, we, we start the circle just right with ourselves. Lord, we don't want to look elsewhere for community. God, we, we would love for you to use gospel centrality in our own hearts to promote community. We want to go be looking for community and expecting others to provide things for us. That we would be going with the gospel 
and bringing the good news of Christ and his love in everything we say and do. We want to be changed, Lord. Please change us. Make these truths central to us. And specifically, Lord, I pray that in this area of just how you highlight what the Greeks and the Jews are prone to do in, in turning to the wisdom or the power of the world for answers. God, you know what? We're just going to be honest with you today. All of us have done that sometime this week. We've, we've, we've thought that human effort or human answers or human strength or human power, a different government, different political leaders, different medicine, just there's so many. There's just so many things. Lord, we, we, we haven't turned first to you. We've turned to the world. We've turned to ourselves. So, Lord, would you lead us on in helping us to grow more cross-centered in our gospel and in our community, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, God loves to put his power on display using the platform of weakness. Um, I, don't need, I just love 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12, where Paul talks about God's grace is sufficient for him. Remember, for his power is perfected in weakness. And then he said, therefore, I'll be all more to, to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ could dwell upon me. I, don't you love that verse? I don't live that verse very well, though. I, I love to think of it in terms of my salvation, but I don't know that I'm living in the good of that verse very well. God, God Christ demonstrated that doctrine, that truth in 2 Corinthians 12 perfectly when he made himself weak upon the cross so as to unleash the power of God to save, to satisfy justice, to forgive, to count us righteous, to adopt sinners as his children. God didn't just do that at the cross. That's what we most needed, and that's where, that's where salvation is located. But you know what? If we don't get that right, we, we're going to, I think we're going to have a tendency to misinterpret the whole, the whole Bible. God has always used the platform of weakness to display his saving power. He always has. But if we're not, if we're not, if we're not willing to say, Lord, the world's going to say it's, it's foolishness to make yourself weak in order to save a group of people. That's foolishness. Why would dying do anything to help the living? That just seems foolishness. Didn't Jesus die a failure? All these things he supposedly came to do, and he died a failure. Well, God's always used the platform of weakness to display his saving power. Let's look at how we can interpret the, interpret the Bible in, incorrectly if we don't see that God uses weakness to perfect his power. And let's use the story of David and Goliath. If, if, we, if we think that, it's, that somehow the power of man or the wisdom of man plays a part in the salvation of man, here's what we're going to do to that story. We're going to think David and all of his strength is the center of the story. And so when we face our giants, this is how the thinking goes. We're to be strong like David. You ever been taught that? You need to be strong like David. I can remember telling my boys that. And if we can manufacture enough faith in God, oh, baby, we too can slay our giants. Yeah. We can, we can knock out our Goliaths. If we can manufacture enough faith in God, that's really what's, what's saying you can be strong and you can manufacture that strength, if you can manufacture your faith, you can slay your Goliaths. God will give you power to kill your giants. Which pretty much makes you the hero of the story, doesn't it? And, that, and don't we love that? We love the fact that I like to, I like to be included in the story of my salvation. <laughs> I, I like to be a key part of the drama of conquering the giant. I love that. Well, David doesn't exist in that story to be a hero of the story. Um, 
David exists in that story to show that we needed a deliverer. He doesn't give you an example for how you are to slay your giants. David exists in that story to see how much we need God to send someone even better than David to slay the giant. What if the story was really supposed to teach us that there was this unknown, insignificant shepherd boy from Bethlehem whose friends abandoned him when he was willing to lay down his life and go armorless to rescue God's people. What if that was what the story is supposed to teach us? The presence of Goliath, just like the presence of sin, meant certain death for everyone. Well, how foolish and weak to think that a shepherd boy from Bethlehem could put death to death. No one could defeat him unless he was sent by God as a deliverer. Hope you can see that we're, we're not David in that story. We're the frightened Israelites in that story. We needed someone to save us from certain death. It's a real story. This is not make-believe. Goliath, I mean, if, if God had not sent David, it, it would have changed history. That's how powerful this Goliath was. We're the frightened Israelites needing God to send a Savior. And in David, God foreshadowed Christ and put to death the giant of death. And one day, God would send a better David. He would be seemingly an insignificant baby, born in a little town of Bethlehem who through his own death put death, sin, judgment, Satan, all of that to death and defeat in what seemed like a foolish and weak plan to save sinners. And what the world sees as foolish and weak is actually God's wisdom and power to not only save sinners, but also to teach us how to live gospel-centered lives. Do you fear your weakness? Isn't that just a problem with our relationships? We don't want to, we just don't want to make ourselves vulnerable because you, likely you're going to get hurt some in that. But what if God wants to even use our hurts as a platform to display his grace and power? I think there's, there's so the, there's going to be the doctrine of the centrality of the cross this morning. But I want you to be thinking about how God would want to use this gospel doctrine in our community. How, how, would he, how would he be calling us to, to live as weak ones who are dependent upon him for strength and wisdom, not turning to the ways of the world? So be, let's be thinking about that. Our main point this morning is this. And forgive me, guys, I'm struggling with some kind of thing. So I hope God gives strength to a weak voice and a weak mind. And uh, there, there's just a lot of weakness on display this morning. Anyway, our main point is this. God calls the foolish to faith through the wisdom of the cross. Only two points. The first one is this. The message of the cross reveals your biggest need. And, and Paul unpacks that in verses 17 through 21. Verse 17, you know, we, we ended with that last week, and I thought it was important to bring that back. It, it, the message of the cross is powerful because it alone is the key to saving and transforming sinners and sustaining them to the end. That is the, that's the message. That's what makes the message of the cross powerful. Save sinners, nothing else can. Transforms. How did, how, how did um, oh, what was the passage? What can change the leopard's spots? What was that? Somebody remind what book? Okay. Well... <laughs> Well, we need to do something about that. Um, anyway, you know, what I'm, you know what I'm talking about? What can change the leopard's spots? Well, nothing. Not, what can, what can, uh, nothing can change the nature of a sinner except something as powerful as the gospel of Christ. 
So Paul says, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom. Literally, it would be, it would be saying this, not with wisdom of words. That is with wisdom of eloquence, wisdom of rhetoric, wisdom of style, of charisma. Lest the cross be emptied of its power to save. See, what happens is if we start just getting all excited about charisma and rhetoric and, and words, people are fancy and they're flowery in their words and a lot of style, there's a lot of stuff. The, the goal is to, just, to move you for a moment, but it leaves you paralyzed for eternity. That's, what, that's the problem with either false teaching or just worldly wisdom. It, it can do nothing to change the heart. And that's why Paul said, if, if you're going to look to rhetoric and wisdom and style and charisma, which a lot of, sadly, a lot of Christianity, I think, has some elements of that, in the United States at least, then, then you're going to rob the cross of its power. Not that the, ro- the cross never is robbed of its power, but what you're, what you're saying is something else can change the human heart. And that's just not true. The only thing that can change the human heart is the word of the cross. So that's why he goes on to say the word of the cross is power. Uh, so Paul said, I haven't come with the wisdom of the world. I have come with the word of the cross. So he's, he's having some fun with the language there. I'm not coming with the word of, word of the world's wisdom. I'm coming with the word of the cross. So let's go to verse 18. He says, the cross, though, is folly or foolishness. Those of you who you know, like words like this, the word literally is moronic. Did you know that for our, the next generation, young people, mor- moron is in the Bible. Um, the cross is folly, it's moronic to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So the message of the cross by God's wisdom and determination, did you notice that right there, the cross divides the entire human race? Um, it, it, and it divides it into two camps. You're either perishing You're among the perishing, you're among the saved. So I put that in your notes. I don't think we can assume that. And you know what? Even if a lot of the adults in this room are saved, we we can't just, do you know there are unbelievers in this room? And they they would be in the form of children who haven't yet come to believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Are you among the perishing or among the saved? That's an important question because, because actually, you know what? Think about all the things you argued about and worried about and grieved about and groaned about and were upset about and angry about this week. Does any of that matter as much as whether you're among the perishing or among the saved? That's where I lose sleep at night. Not about my own salvation. Thank God for my salvation and the grace that affirms it and the word that affirms it. But I, I get concerned. Are you among the perishing or among the saved? How you view and value the cross will determine which camp you're in. That's as simple as it is. What is your view of the cross? What is your view of the cross? Let's continue to see what he had to say. The perishing see the cross and the message of the cross as foolishness and weakness. These people believe it would be foolish to try to find their life and happiness and meaning in a man whose mission failed horribly through a horrible death on a a despised cross. And that this message was so weak, um, I mean, the man died as a failure. There's no way a failure can provide you with the life that you think you need to be happy. It's foolish to those who are perishing. The message of the cross doesn't make sense to people who center their lives on philosophy, on science, on flashy charismatic rhetoric, or displays of power, even supernatural power. They don't understand why we would devote our lives to this God-man who lived in relative obscurity, died a death, that made him more, look more weak and impotent and shameful, more like a loser, and even more, 
that the leaving in this weak, crucified man could actually give you eternal life and change your heart? Hmm. Well, the saved see the cross and the message of the cross as wisdom, meaning that justice was not compromised, but satisfied in the cross, so that forgiveness could be granted and righteousness extended and adoption secured, and to see it as power, power to raise up the sinner from being dead in sin, to believe in Christ, power to transform the nature of the sinner, power to do the ministry and mission of Jesus, power to sustain the believer until he sees Jesus face to face, power to give him a, a new, resurrected, glorified body one day. I love the, the, the line we sang today, save to sin no more. Don't you long for that day? I'm just so tired of sinning. God will give us a new, resurrected, glorified body to go with, our, with the new nature he's given us in Christ, and we will be saved to sin no more. That's powerful. That's powerful. Verse 19 gives, this is interesting, because 19 gives us an illustration of how, God, of how God's people are always pressured to forsake their weakness and, depend, and, and dependence on the Lord. And instead of waiting on the Lord, to turn in favor of immediate relief and happiness by looking to the wisdom or the power of the world. And God promises that there will be no help in the wisdom of the world because he's ultimately going to destroy it. So just in this, it, this is one of those areas where it's so helpful to go back and dig that down into when the New Testament quotes, quotes the old. Go back and see what, what's the context because, oh, it adds such color. You'll see in just a second here. So, so the Lord says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The discernment of the discerning I will thwart. So at first thought, if you're just reading this casually, I think it'd be easy to say, why would God destroy wisdom? Why would he destroy the wisdom of the wise? Now, it's talking about worldly wisdom. Why would God want to destroy the wisdom of the world? Okay, well, let's go back through the pages of Scripture, back to Genesis. It's because... What we see through the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, starting in the book of Genesis, is that the wisdom of the world is not innocent. It's not innocent. When Adam and Eve believed there was wisdom and power and pleasure that was available to them without needing God, remember that was the offer. Hear this fruit, it's going to make you wise, it's going to give you pleasure, it's going to give you the life that God's holding out, by the way. You know, this is a way you can, you can have, in fact, you can be like God. You don't need God. You can have all of these things without following God. Wisdom and pleasure and satisfaction and joy. See, that, what he's leading them to is not innocent. And so when, when they took that fruit, it was the first expression of imbibing upon the wisdom of the world. So when you think of the wisdom of the world, it goes back and it's rooted there. Particularly, remember it says, it will make you wise. It, it, will, it, will, it will give you the delusion that by yourself, you can decide what's right and wrong. And isn't there, that's where our world is. You don't need somebody to tell you what's right and wrong. What are you, some baby? You don't need someone to tell you what's right and wrong. You don't need some old ancient book to tell you. What's right and wrong? You are the man. You're the woman. You can decide. It's not even to discern what's right and wrong. That was the, that was the deception of that lie. You can decide what's right and wrong. And then you know what you're going to do with that? You're going to decide for everyone else too. And here, we, here, here go the wars. Here goes divorce. Here goes parents and children separating. Here goes just all the way on to world war. The wisdom of the world is not innocent. And in that context, we know it as sin. It was defiance of God. So let's draw this to, to maybe just our day-to-day -day life and how we can grow. Anytime we doubt God's word in favor of human wisdom or earthly pleasure or power, I think we question God's character. We question him being good and loving and wise and generous. 
When we live according to the wisdom of the world, we want to be ruled more by self than by God. So the fundamental character of the wisdom of the world is an attempt to reject God. That's, that's the wisdom of the world. Reject God, rebel against God, and in so doing, um, you know, it's going to come off as being clever and attractive. But it always will lead to misery, suffering, and death. And really, who needs wisdom when you have Google? Well, in verse 19, Paul gives an example of how God brings an end to the wisdom and power offered by the world. And he takes us back to Isaiah 29. Jerusalem was surrounded by the Assyrian army led by Sennacherib. His army was overwhelming. So I just so let's just kind of try to create a little similar scenario. So let's say all the open border stuff has just made us so vulnerable to enemy attack, and and they they come in like a flood, and they're bringing mili military weaponry that we never thought you could get across the border. <laughs> I guess who knows what's coming across the border. But this would be the, this enemy army entering into a, an area that thought was to be undefeatable. This was God's country. <laughs> Sounds a lot like Texas, right? Um, so, so, so here he comes. And the, imagine being in Midland, and we're not that far from the border, and we're starting to hear our own Sennacherib is coming, and he just devastated El Paso. And he wiped out Pecos, and he, he wiped out Monaghan's, and and Odessa's next in his sights, and it's, it's getting close to us. And with each news bulletin that comes across and the smoke of a burning city, he, he, we're getting closer and closer to what's going to happen to us. But he didn't attack Jerusalem directly yet. He laid siege to Jerusalem to drain it of its resources and, it, and its strength and to progressively increase fear among the people. I think in many ways, evil is trying to do that right now. I think in many ways, it's trying to convince Christians that somehow we're under siege. And, and that if we don't do things the world's way, there will be, I'm going to use this word theologically, hell to pay. The message to God's people here was that their only hope was not in praying to some invisible God. How weak is that to save them from this enemy attack, from their problems or from their pain? Too weak to give them what they really needed. Here's what you need. You need to, to, surrender, to the power, surrender to the power of the world. That's the answer. Surrender to the power of the world. Because of the siege, people were growing weaker as time went on. Even if they were at full strength from a mere human standpoint, they would not have been able in the natural to defeat the massive Assyrian army. They were not only powerful militarily, they were, they were mean. The, the horror stories, the atrocities, the things you hear even now in the, the conflict with Israel and Hamas and just all that's going on over there. You hear about atrocities. Well, Boy, there were horrible things the Assyrian army was doing. So now, now get yourself here. So you already were weak, but now your weakness just keeps getting weaker. Gosh, there's so many little phrases here that I think might apply to some people's hearts. I think there may be some of us who have been hanging on there and we've been wanting to trust God, but we're so tempted to either go back to a sinful habit to go, to go, to cross a line that we know we shouldn't go. We know it. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know what your situation would be, but don't you feel like sometimes you feel like that sometimes? I'm already weak, and my weakness is weakening. Sennacherib didn't just try to use sheer power, though, to get Israel to surrender. He had this spokesperson. Someone who was a very eloquent spokesperson who, who would use the wisdom of words to get Israel to surrender. So now picture this. This guy gets, get, now, so they're close enough, man. They, 
they've, there's, no, there's no defense. So the Assyrian army has come very close now to Jerusalem. This guy, so close, this guy gets on the wall of Jerusalem. And now it's, it's uh, <laughs> I'm sorry guys, my mind is just not, my mind is weak. Never mind, never mind. I, I'm just, I'm feeling less than, I usually feel less. Um, trying to picture, what would a contemporary kind of picture of this be? This guy is broadcasting 24-7. 24-7. Oh, maybe like uh, the internet. And Do you remember, how many of you are old enough to remember the days when TV, you had, there was nothing to watch after midnight? Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember that? Uh, not even infomercials, you youngster. Don't you get... Don't you get uppity with me, Brad. Brad, there was nothing. There was the, there was the national anthem. And then your screen went yeah. black. Oh, for the day. Oh, for the day. Because now it's 24-7. This guy on the wall telling us where real life is found. And, and, and you really don't need, listen, you have Jesus as your Savior, but listen, the, God will understand if you do this to add a little bit more spice to your life. This guy was 24-7 bl blistering them with propaganda to defeat Israel with words. He was, he was trying to use fleshly and finite and flowery words that would be fatal, I had to give one more F there, to God's people. Guys, I do that in my sleep. I can't help it. I've been a pastor so long. I have dreams that all my sentences start with an F. I mean, it's the craziest thing. Um, but he's, he's, he, he was like the serpent in Genesis. He was raising himself up as the authority and that his word should be believed and God's word ignored and the sitting ducks, this is what I meant to say last week, I have such a burden for our, for our teenagers and for the younger ones. They are sitting ducks for that propaganda. There's a louder and sweeter voice for them to listen to, and it's coming. It's, it's, it needs to come from dads and moms through the gospel, and brothers and sisters, and the gathered church, and pastors and preachers through the gospel. His, his speech was filled with empty promises about what surrendering to this earthly power could do for Israel. Imagine the kind of life that you could have if you didn't have to follow the rules all the time. Yeah, right. Break the law and find freedom. That's, yeah, break God's law. There's freedom in disobedience. Such a lie, but we give into it all the time. And his empty threats could turn from not just being flowery and winsome and seductive, but he also could use turn and, and turn into threats and stir fear as a motivation for surrendering. How many times have you made your worst decisions because you were afraid that if I didn't give in to the pressure, I was going to lose something that I needed to have for, for a happy life? I was afraid I was going to lose something and I made the worst mistake of my life instead of trusting the Lord, instead of saying, God, I'm weak. And I'm going to use that weakness as, as dependence upon you. And I'm going to trust because you had your son die on the cross for me and you raised him from the dead on the third day that you will bring me through this too. So verse 20 says, where's the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? So we're kind of fast forwarding, forwarding back to Corinth and then I'll tell you how it turned out in, back in, uh, with Jerusalem and Sennacherib and Assyria. So, so, so you've either got seduction, you've got threats, you've got the force, the power, the impressiveness of the world, all pressing down on you 24-7. And then this is, I don't know, this is, this is where, I don't know whether <laughs> Phil has me on a bunch of breathing treatments. Sometimes I, was got, I got a little woozy from those breathing treatments, and I don't know what was in those breathing treatments. But this is what I, how I thought, I, I think maybe is, is this. I don't think this is a breathing treatment. So when Paul says, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of the age? What really Paul is doing, he's, he's calling for a duel with the people's cultural and religious idols. So I want you to think, anybody like Westerns? 
Wow. You live in Texas. Oh, my goodness. Okay, well, put up with me. I kind of like a good Western. And if there was going to be a duel, almost, I know it's almost comical now. It's probably more of a meme now, but I think in the original days of Westerns, when there was going to be a duel, what was the melody that was played for a duel? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Da -da 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 -da. Wah, wah, wah. Right? That's it. So I think what Paul is doing, he's, he, he, essentially it's God calling these people to account. You want to you deceive my people? You want to duel? You come to me. So that's what he's saying. Where, where's the one who's wise? Where's this, the, and, and where's the scribe? Where's the debater of the age? So let's kind of pick through those real quickly. The wise man at that time was a kind of a, he had a public philosophy that explained everything. You were either a Stoic or an Epicurean, you were a Sophist, and if you held any of those worldviews, then that worldview explained the world for you and for everyone else, and there was arguments as to who was better. But this wisdom had no place for a holy and righteous creator, man's condition of sin, against that creator as his biggest problem, and Christ's death on the cross as the only way for life and forgiveness to come. Where's the scribe? Now he goes to the Jews, experts in Jewish law, in a work-centered salvation that awaited the arrival of a militaristic Messiah. They knew the Old Testament law and scriptures as well as anyone, and yet they were the most opposed to Jesus. They conformed to the Messiah that they wanted it to have in their own image. They conformed the Messiah to their own image of that way they wanted to be. And so they were blind to the scriptures that they thought they knew so well. Where's the debater of this age? You ever have that kind of person in your life? They're so skilled in philosophy and debate. They represent the best of thinking, the Romans and the Greeks. They, they're kind of the people who backed you into the corner with their commentary and their charisma and make you feel like a fool if you disagree. You ever have those people? I am not one of those people. I am a, I just... If, Jan is really smart, and I'm really not. So guess who wins the intense fellowship moments that we have in our marriage? Because Jan, Jan, and she's eloquent. So Jan will come up, well, here's reason one why we should do it. Reason, reason 73,000 why we should do this. And I'm, and I'm, you know, and sometimes we get a little bit intense with each other, and here's my best result. Here's my best comeback. You ready? Here's my, oh, Yeah. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> She's usually right. That's what's, um, it's wonderful, but for my pride, it's, you know. Anyway, moving forward. Um, so that, the debater of this age, there are people out there that could convince a struggling Christian that it's actually better for you not to trust the Lord. God will destroy the wisdom of the wise and make foolish the wisdom of the world. So King Hezekiah was the, the, the king of Israel at that time of Jerusalem, of Judah. And Hezekiah did the weakest thing he could do in the eyes of the Assyrian army. Here's how he did. Oh, yeah? I'll see your threats. I'll see your rhetoric. I'm going to pray. I'm going to point my people to the power of God. Because he saves the weak. Look at this. Look at this verse. Verse 7. So 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verses 7 and 8. And I really believe this was for some, maybe a few people here this morning. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him. For there's a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of the flesh. But with us, the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. Isn't that good? That's become a favorite verse now. And then verse 20, King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, cried out in prayer to heaven about this. And look what happens in verse 21. This is all in your notes. And the Lord God sent an angel who annihilated 
all the fighting men and the commanders and officers in the camp of the Assyrian king. So Sennacherib, all this power and pomp and circumstance, he withdrew to his own land in disgrace. And, he, and when he went into the temple of his God, some of his own sons, his own flesh and blood, cut him down with a sword. You don't think God will act for the good of his people. Verse 21 says, For since in the wisdom of God the world did not come to know God through wisdom, God determined, guys, that the world through its wisdom would not know him. Otherwise, people are going to pat themselves on their back for all eternity about how wise they were to come up with a plan of salvation themselves or how wise they were to accept the plan of salvation for themselves. Listen, a God discovered by human wisdom is going to be a God that is conformed to a fallen man or woman. A God discovered by human wisdom and human IQ and human education, it would be a source of pride. Well, I'm thankful, God, that you did, you know, some of these for my salvation, but if it weren't for me, <laughs> you know, that, that was the key point. Thanks, Jesus, you did a lot. But if it weren't for me, if it weren't that I went to enough Sunday school classes, went to enough Bible studies and all these things, I came to this conclusion. And Paul said, God, God said, the, through the wisdom of the world, you will not come to know God. Jesus wasn't an attractive message of power. He wasn't a message that makes us feel good about ourselves. It's a message about our sin and our need for a good, good, good Savior. So this good news of God revealing himself and his plan of salvation th through Christ and the cross enables even the worst sinner to be saved. So you do it God's way, the biggest sinner in the universe can be saved. Amen. Children can be saved. Men, women, rich, poor. Every ethnicity can be saved because it's based on what God does, not what we do. And so it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. David Garland put it this way, God was wise enough not to let the wisdom of the world be the key to knowing God. So, last part, verses 22 and 25, the message of the cross provides you your greatest joy. So now, Paul takes those who are perishing and divides them into two groups. And each group represents, really, I guess you could say, foundational reasons for why people reject God, okay? Um, and Jesus said, listen, if, you know, the, the, and the first one is Jews demand signs. So this is going to be one of the reasons people reject God and you see it in the ways Jews demanded signs. Well, Jesus said there would be one sign. Do you remember what it was? The sign of Jonah. The sign of Jonah. That's what he was going to give to them. What's the sign of Jonah? That he would die, he would be buried, and on the third day he would rise from the dead. Well, that sign is the sign of the cross, right? So he said, I'm going to give you a sign, but let's talk about this need. What is this, this thing about signs? The Jews were as much, in, they were just, they were consumed with authenticating who Christ was by demanding signs. But that almost sounds too noble. They, they were looking for a certain kind of authority, a power that they could control. They really wanted healing upon demand. And this, this whole control thing is weirdly what's going to come back to Food on demand. Eliminate the Romans on demand. If you are the Messiah, right, that's so much of the New Testament, if you are the Messiah, then blank. Even on the cross. If you are the Messiah, what? Come off the cross. That's, they were constantly in that mindset. Essentially, it's this. And so now be careful because this is where it's going to come close to us. Essentially, it's this. I want God's blessings, but I want to stay in control of my life. I'll take every miracle you can give me. I'm going to stay in control of my life. Why didn't Jesus just come along and just do what they asked for? And wouldn't that shut them up? 
How's that work with parents and children? <laughs> you know, I mean, don't we sometimes think that? Okay, I will give this to you. And 20 seconds later, they want something else. So did we. Kids, I'm not just saying, oh, kids are bad. No, I was a bad kid. All of us were kids before you were kids. We did the same thing. So, so what, what's the problem? The problem is that if Jesus would have done that, they would have come back the next day and said, well, that miracle was fine for yesterday. I need one today. If I'm going to believe in you today, you need to do a miracle like you did yesterday. Oh, man. As I was studying this, I just thought, Lord, I do this to you in so many ways. You've given me the greatest salvation I could ever hope to have, a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The sign of the cross is the greatest sign that I could ever have and that I will ever need. The resurrection, the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection. Greatest sign that I could ever have and that I would ever need. And then I still ask you to prove yourself by you bowing down to my will about what I think would be good for my life. Pray for me, because I found myself in what he's describing here. What have you done for me lately? I think that can be a mindset. D.A. Carson said some great stuff. Look, this is in your notes. I, think this, I hope this will bless you. Thus, the demand for signs becomes the prototype of every condition human beings raise as a barrier to being open to God. I will devote myself to God if he heals my child. I will follow Jesus if I can maintain my independence. I will, be happily, I will happily be a Christian if God proves himself to me. I will turn from my sin and read the Bible if my marriage gets sorted out to my satisfaction. I will acknowledge Jesus as Lord if he performs the kind of miracle on demand that removes all doubt. In every case, I'm assessing him. He's not assessing me. I'm not coming to him on his terms. Rather, I am stipulating terms that he must accept if he wants the privilege of my company. This person would say, I'm, I'm, I'm a spiritual person. There's a lot of people out there like that. You ever start to share the gospel? They're like, oh, I'm spiritual. <laughs> okay. I'm open to spiritual things, even if there is a God. But I want to stay in control, and I want to stay at the center of my life. This cross, this death, this apparent defeat, that doesn't look like the miracle I'm looking for. That looks weak. That doesn't look powerful. The Greeks seek wisdom. Well, this isn't necessarily requiring God to do something miraculous. This is demanding God to explain himself. This was a week study in this where I'm going, again, there's way too much of this in my life. Demanding God to conform to my understanding of what is good and right and satisfying. God, I want to measure you by what's reasonable to me. I want to set the standard that you must meet and explain yourself to me. I want God to explain himself based on my education, my imagination, my experiences, my value system, my worldview, my predispositions. I demand that God scientifically verify and prove his existence to the satisfaction of my understanding. Carson again, he said, speaking of the Greeks, they create entire structures of thought so as to maintain the delusion that they can explain everything, anything. They think they are scientific, in control, and powerful. God, if he exists, must meet the high standards of their academic and philosophical prowess and somehow fit into their system if he's going to be given any sort of respectful hearing. Is there anyone here this morning who has experienced a heartache? And it's a disappointment. It shook you up. You never thought that this would be something that you would maybe have to walk through as a child of God. And instead of looking back to Christ for your bearings, for, to get your balance again, 
looking back to the cross, you found yourself pulling aside and really refusing to go deeper unless God explains to you why he allowed that to happen. Oh, God wants to meet you today. He wants to meet you, even though you've maybe stepped aside. He wants you to meet you today. And to take you back to the school of the cross, where the depth of his love is really experienced and felt. And that's why in verse 23, Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. It's a stumbling block for Jews. It's foolishness to the Gentiles. Of course, it's a stumbling a, a crucified Messiah? A, a crucified Messiah who was cursed on a tree? That's foolish. I'm not going to follow that kind of Messiah. But what if he was dying on that tree to bear your curse? You need to be saved from the wrath of God. Your sin has cursed you in your separation from the Lord. And Jesus bore your curse. The Romans would have revolted to even speak of the cross as a good thing. I think if we could put, bring somebody uh, out from the history of Rome and, and somehow beam them into our society and that they would see so many people wearing crosses and necklaces or earrings or lapels and they might get sick so as to vomit. Because in their eyes it would have been like wearing the, 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 the cloud of the atomic bomb or the mass graves of Auschwitz or it was revolting to the Roman. There is no way anything good can come into my life through such a revolting death of criminals. Verse 24. Eric, you want to come on back up? But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. One theologian said that this is the Christian's greatest joy, to see that Christ is the wisdom and power of God. This is what should bow our knees in worship and then get us off our, our knees onto our feet with joy, knowing that God has called us by his grace into a relationship where he provided the wisdom that was needed for a just God to justify a sinner? How does that happen? How does God maintain, maintain his holiness he can't just say, oh, it's okay, you disobey, just forget about it. He can't do that. He's perfect in his holiness and righteousness. So how, what does a wise God do? A wise God and a loving God gives his perfect and only begotten son, lives a sinless life in, in actions and thoughts and motives, hangs on a cross to be punished as though he were guilty of all the disobedience we've done in mind and actions and motives, so that then the justice is satisfied. There, was, there needed to be a price paid. Jesus paid the price. God's holiness and righteous wrath was satisfied. And God is a God of love. Oh my goodness, this is amazing how this is working out. So justice is satisfied so that love can be hurled up out upon us and embrace us with forgiveness and righteousness and adoption as sons and daughters and the power of the Spirit indwelling us so that we can do, we can have a new heart. We have new hearts. Can you believe it? Oh my goodness. We didn't just believe the right things. He gave us a new heart. That's what it means to be born again. All of that because of the wisdom and the power of the cross. Would you stand with us and let's sing. Let's close the service in singing.